You can play anything over top of it. And I was like, what? Oh, I can make it up myself. <laughs> that was it, Adam. From there on, <laughs> I you're said, hooked. you know what? <laughs> That's it. I'm doing this the rest of my life. <laughs> wow. I'm excited to hear about your journey in music. That's what this podcast is all about. And of, of course, I want to hear about the 100 Days Impact Challenge as well. Fantastic. Cool. So first off, where were you born and raised? Yeah, so I was born in Norfolk, Virginia. Okay. And so I, and I was, I, I would consider myself to be born into music. Really? Okay. Uh, yeah, because I started playing the piano when I was two years old. And I... I had this ability when I, I was a, a kid to be able to focus on things for long periods of time, right? Mm -hmm. So, so my, my, my parents observed, oh, they could just give me some pennies and I could just play with the pennies, treat the pennies like Legos, right? Like, oh, wow, oh, sure. Houses <laughs> with that or, or rocks or, or whatever. And so, so my, my father um, said, hey, why don't we try him on piano? And so they got the piano from my grandmother's house, which she didn't play the piano. So it was the piano was just sitting there and they, they took it from Portsmouth, Virginia to Norfolk, Virginia. And my earliest memory, Adam, was sitting on phone books in front of the piano. Wow. Right. And, and so unlike most kids that, you know, that are two years old and a piano, like they're usually like banging on the piano. It, yeah. Right, right. They're smashing it. Like, yeah, oh, we have you know, we have a little have piano and my older son plays keyboard, but we had a little one. Um, it's probably about as big as my desk. Mm -hmm. And he would just go, yeah, smash it. We got him a drum kit because that <laughs> it's better for right. me than that. <laughs> right, right. Because you know, for 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 a kid, usually, you know, that is a drum. <laughs> right, of course. Other sounds. <laughs> Right. Almost everything is a drum at it too. Right. Uh, except, except for I, I didn't treat the piano like it was a drum. Interesting. For some reason, I, I would press the notes down intentionally and like, listen, and I remember hitting, hitting them and like being very interested in, and curious about the sounds being created. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, I think that curiosity, you know, has been with me my entire life like curiosity around sounds, curiosity around, um, you know, what if you put these things, these two things together, mm -hmm. uh, what, what would happen uh, if that were to happen? And so, so I started in classical piano and then, um, and then I started to, to lose interest actually in music Interesting. Um, because I wanted to be able to play like Michael Jackson and, I want to play stuff I was hearing on the radio, right? Uh -huh. So, so the the uh, and the classical teachers I had, you know, I'd always want to embellish Mozart or embellish Beethoven. They're like, Marcus, keep playing the music the way it was written. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, but I want to do this, right? So I was, so I felt like my my creativity was being constrained, and and so my um, so my mother tuned into this and said, you know what? I'm going to reach out to this professional musician. It was like this jazz musician. Uh -huh. uh, he was, his name's Rogers Brown. And he did was she, the chair. Did she know him personally or? Uh -huh, cause, oh, cause, okay. my, Cause my mother uh, worked at Norfolk State University in community relations. Uh, and okay. so she went to the head of the music department who was a professional musician that that a pianist that played in the area and so forth professionally, as well as being the head of the music department there. And she said, will you teach my son how to play jazz piano? Okay. And he said, I don't teach kids. <laughs> I would think that is probably his <laughs> response. <laughs> Wait, he's two? Heck no. <laughs> Wait a minute, he's nine? I was nine. I was oh, you're nine, nine at this time. <laughs> <laughs> he's nine? No way. <laughs> right? And and so so she said to him, 
he's actually a child prodigy and it's not going to be what you expect it to be okay from a kid and so he's like all right i'll do one lesson and we'll you know let's talk about it afterwards right sure and adam that first lesson he taught me the blues scale okay and so the blues scale now you know for those of you that don't know about blues scales so the way blues scales work in blues music is those sets of notes allow you to create so all of a sudden this scale gave me freedom over blues chord changes to be able to create and invent and 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 um and inside of the structure of the scales creates music that was it seemed like it was coming from me sure and so that and he was brilliant because he said you can play anything that you want and these are the chords and inside of these chords you can play anything over top of it and i was like what oh i can make it up myself <laughs> that was it adam from there on <laughs> i you're said hooked. you know what <laughs> That's it. I'm doing this the rest of my life. <laughs> wow. Right. And they could not pull me off of the piano. So I went from like almost quitting music to like they had to really literally drag me. Marcus, come eat. And wow. so for that summer, I practiced every single day for hours. Like I was putting in eight hours, like, like overtime you know, sure. on the piano and with a passion. And I remember like the world just disappearing that summer and all there was, was that music. And it's kind of like what, what's happening with the hundred days impact challenge, right? It's like repeated activity every single day. And when you do repeated activity every single day, with intention then things move and what moved for me in that period uh was i came out of that summer being able to perform professionally wow and so i ended up uh then having to hire some of my teachers to be my backup man really were you writing your own? So you're writing your own songs. You weren't even just trying to focus on learning other people's pieces. It I was, was like, I was I'm doing gonna, both. I was, yeah. I was, I was learning others. I was writing, I was producing. Um, and so I started my, my first record label, uh, when I was 12. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so I, I, um, I really enjoyed that period because all there was in those moments was this possibility of being able to, to express myself through music and have it reach audiences and for me to be able to play with that expression and see what worked, see what didn't work. And so I also played other instruments. So I started picking up other instruments like saxophone and bass and drums and and in high school, I even played the tuba in the, in the marching band, right? And so, so I started again back to sounds, like the opportunity to play with different sounds. I started looking at, well, wow, the piano was a great foundation for me to have something to relate to other instruments with. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. What other instruments were you learning at the time? So the main instrument that I ended up being drawn to back then, I was drawn to all of them, but, but I, I say piano was my, uh, my first wife. And then my second wife <laughs> <laughs> was the saxophone. Oh, interesting. And, and her name was Crystal. Oh, what was the name of the piano? name your instruments. What was piano's name? Oh. <laughs> uh, the piano, her name 
was well i can't tell you what her name was oh uh, okay this is I, a can't secret? Tell you <laughs> I can't tell you what her name was <laughs> <laughs> you forgot her name <laughs> I forgot her name. <laughs> oh man. Uh oh. <laughs> I forgot her name. But she calls me. Oh, she still does. That's good. <laughs> Next time she, she calls, calls you, she ask her. <laughs> Every time I walk past the piano, she hollers at me. Yeah, be like, like hello. I, I, how do you spell your name again? <laughs> right, right. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. She's like, hello. I know you're like doing courses and training people and helping people become influencers and all that but hello remember me <laughs> <laughs> that's funny oh okay so yeah so 12 you have this record label and what do you do you start finding other musicians and helping them put I, out well I, music? yeah i was putting out my own music okay and so i was recording and i had this uh teacher in high school that was teaching recording arts and so i hired him to help mix and master so i, I learned a bit about mi mixing and mastering mm -hmm. my productions uh because I, I had a four track and so i was using the four track and stacking vocals and you know learning how to produce sure and and someone hired me uh when i was eight years old to do a replay of a Whitney Houston song. Oh, wow. And because they couldn't find a karaoke, right? Uh -huh. And so I had my four track and I, I redid that Whitney Houston background track and everything. And I, I remember uh, now I was, I was nine and I got paid $120 for to that. To recreate that? Yep. I'll That's never pretty good. That, That's pretty like, good money, oh, right? Wait a minute. Exactly. For an eight, <laughs> nine year old, I'm like, sure. okay, $120. Yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> right? right. It was, it, it actually showed me that music and the production of music had value that could be exchanged for money. Mm -hmm. This was the, the lesson that it, it taught me as an entrepreneur was, wait a minute, there are many different ways to create value. So I, I, had, I had made money before, um, you know, as an actor and, and <laughs> as, a, as a performer, mm -hmm. but no one had hired me or I hadn't made money actually creating music in my, you know, living room recording studio for track. Sure. Right. And so what I saw was, well, wait a minute. This person had a problem, right? They couldn't find this uh, karaoke to be able to, to do whatever was important to them and perform. And they came to me and I was able to provide something of value to solve their problem. And, and they paid me well for it. <laughs> And it didn't take me that long to do it. Right. So and from so, there, do you do you build a career and like creating these recreations of songs for for karaoke? So that is a great question because that skill from way back then uh -huh. has served me throughout my career. Is that right? Right. Because so in TV and film. Uh -huh. This is where uh, this has become useful. So I did not know I was developing all these capacities. <laughs> you, you know, like I, right. I've been producing for so long, right? That when I started really getting into producing, I did it like I did learning the piano. So I would listen to David Foster and, and try and imitate him. I would listen to Babyface and try and imitate him. Anything I heard, like Run DMC, I imitate that. I listen to James Brown. Okay, funk. Let me see if I can imitate that and, and create something that sounded like George Clinton in Parliament, right? <laughs> Let me see if I can do a sex machine, <laughs> right? Do, do that. And so there's a process that great artists go through mm -hmm. um, that I've noticed. 
And so there's imitation, right? And that's the imitation phase. So, you know, so I'm studying Charlie Parker, or Oscar Peterson on the piano, I'm studying Beethoven. And so, so you're imitating, you know, someone else. And then there's emulation. Mm -hmm. So that's creating something that sounds kind of like similar, sure. Right. So this kind of sounds like Timbaland. This kind of sounds like Pharrell. This kind of sounds like Dr. Dre. Uh -huh. Right. And then there's innovation, which is you are now sounding like yourself. Right. Right. And so every great artist has a voice where they have gone through some form of what I just articulated uh -huh. to discover their voice. Sure. Right. Uh -huh. And so, so for me, the way that served me in, in my career is someone that has a movie or someone that, that, that has, you know, some companies that can't clear Beyonce can't clear you know, some, some great, you know, some right rock thing, right. whatever they would right. come to me and say, Marcus, you know, we had a problem clearing Beyonce's song. Can you, do you have something that's like it? Right. Oh, that's okay. Go ahead. Cause I have a huge question for you after this emulation emulation. So that is a thing. And because, okay. So <laughs> my wife and I watched the bachelor. I'm going to have to let that out there right now. And okay. they always use this so, like they use this clip of music and they've used it numerous times throughout the, the different seasons. And it sounds like the beginning to time of your life by green day. It's the same chords and it's in the same kind of uh, rhythm, but it changes a little bit. Uh -huh. And then it's like, was that green day? Oh wait, no, it went somewhere else, but you can hear it. And my wife, I've noticed it a bunch and then she picked it up and she said that sounded that sounded like they took a Green Day song, but then like didn't. And I said, that that's what I heard. <laughs> yeah. So this is a thing. It is a thing. Thank goodness. <laughs> wow. Okay. Because that because that thing has paid my bills <laughs> more than one time in my career, right? Interesting. And and um and it's 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 a thing because and it's it's a thing deeper than even what we're talking about because everything has a source everything has some kind of source mm -hmm. we become products of our environment sure. right and so so whether it's a systemic source whether it's oh i was just around so like i i have a, a friend of mine that uh came and spoke in the hundred days impact inner circle mm -hmm. and she's an attorney uh but she was there during the motown days okay mm -hmm. and so she was in the environment where hits were being made right so she as a kid was on the floor when Smokey robinson was coming up with you know whatever right That's crazy. she yeah. was there when Michael Jackson and the Jackson five came in the door, she was there when, right. Mm -hmm. Being in the environment. So, so her ear for hits is quite keen, mm -hmm. right? Because she's been in that environment. My daughter, uh, who's six years old, she's grown up in an environment where they're like, you know, celebrities that she calls auntie or, or uncle, wow. whatever, yeah. that sold millions of records and, and all of that. And she, when she was a baby, she was in a crib in the recording studio while I was working on an album. <laughs> Whoa, that's right? awesome. Sure. Right? And, and so, so we become products of that environment and that gets articulated so for my daughter is articulate. She knows herself as a songwriter. So she recorded her first song when she was two. Oh right? my gosh. Right. She's written hooks that, that a couple of artists have, have done the hooks. Right. And that, that type of thing. And she, she understands, you know, a bit about celebrity and, and all of that because she's in that environment. And mm -hmm. so what happens is when someone's around an environment, 
this mm -hmm. is the same thing for uh, someone that's born for uh, business aims, like they want to be an entrepreneur. Like you put yourself in an environment with other entrepreneurs. Sure. Right. If you want to have a great relationship, love life, you put yourself in an environment with people that are having a great relationship, love life. Right. Right. If you want to be a DJ or podcaster, put yourself in an environment with podcasters. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and DJs, right? Because just by being in the environment, you're able to pick up different things and, and it may not be intentional. It may just come out of you. Mm -hmm. And so this is what happens with recording artists. And this is another you know, thing that the, like the hundred days impact challenge provides, right? Is an environment of people that are ambitiously going after a particular aim. And so it's, it's a set up community and environment and some activities that you take on that actually have you get a result. And mm -hmm. the same thing happens with recording artists, right? So they're in an environment. So, so if you have a, a, a song that's in the club setting, um, there are many times I've been to clubs with artists that I've been in the studio with, right? That we we'll go into the club environment if we're working on something that we're gonna make for that environment. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so if you're trying to make a dance song, it might be a good idea for you to go to where people are dancing. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a good idea. Right. And be in an environment and pay attention to our, how people are moving, what songs did they connect with, what songs cleared the floor. Sure. You don't want to do something that sounds like that. Right, right. What song got people on the floor? Why did they get on the floor? What was the intro of that song that was that call that said, hey, that's my jam and had people jump on the floor and make their bodies move, right? Mm -hmm. This is studying the environment. So being a student of the environment that you wanna excel in with whatever it is that you're looking to create is crucial. I love that. It makes total sense, right? I mean, it's, it's uh, surround yourself with people that you want to be like, right? Almost, or so, right. surround yourself in in an environment of something that you want to you want to be around. Or if you, yeah, like you said, if you want to write a dance hit, you're not going to learn it sitting at home. You're going to learn it going to the club and figuring out what songs people are dancing to. Yeah, absolutely. And and I really believe in being a designer of environment. So the physical environment, the human environment, and the conversational environment, mm -hmm. right? Because there are some conversations that, that, that I just won't participate in, <laughs> right? Sure. Because those conversations aren't the environment of upliftment. Uh -huh. Those conversations are the narrative environment that is heart centered. So the us and them, us versus them, the isms, racism, sexism, like those are narrative environments that I opt out of. <laughs> sure. <laughs> right. And so, so I, I like to surround myself with those narrative environments that actually um, are fulfilling mm -hmm. and uplifting like that. And mm -hmm. so, so we have that choice. We have that choice to, to, uh, to decrease the noise and increase the signal of what we most care about. Mm -hmm. And so curating your environment, physical and otherwise, and mental environment, <laughs> right um you know your listeners can't see how sparse your background is right there are right. three three elements in your background sure right that's a good point right that's a curated environment mm -hmm. and it's like yeah i i, I yeah that and it's a personality thing. Like, you, you know, I see your background, you've got the green screening background, but you have your impact days and just the vibe of, of your 
room and your setting and, and mine are just, yeah, that's just kind of who your personality is and how you want to present yourself, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and this, is, this is crucial for people to consider. A lot of times people don't consider these things. Sure. They don't, they, you know, you hear the, oh, your bank account is the, the summation of the five people that you spend the most time with. Right. Yeah. I've heard that before, which is interesting. Right. Right. Like the, the five people, well, that's environment. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there are the, there are some of those narratives that give some clue to uh, creation, but I've ended up um, over the years, I've created some programs to help people discover these things. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause I had to discover it myself. Right. Because there, there was, there were, were times where I were, I was in to toxic environments, right? Environments uh, that, you know, that were not uplifting but downshifting. Right. Right. And so, so I had to learn for myself. Well, wait a minute. I, that's not what I want for my life. And this is how I designed. So I, so I created a set of tools that I use personally to get out of debt, mm -hmm. to, uh, to clear my environment space in terms of the people and the narratives and so forth that, that actually align with my sole purpose and discovering what that is and so forth. And so I've created these tools and, you know, courses I have like Wealth and Impact Bootcamp mm -hmm. to help support people discover it and actually design their lives. Interesting. Yeah, because you do way more than just write songs and help you you kind of build brands and like you just said you have people you have different uh courses on you know how to get out of debt for example like you just said but it, you've kind of branched out and in, into a lot of different little things and little elements correct yeah and, and it's all connected so when i uh was doing a lot of mentoring with recording artists, some celebrity artists around the world, uh, I'll be in situations where the conversations outside of the creative environment with artists would be the conversations that were actually more important, I would say, sometimes than the music even, mm -hmm. right? Because when you have achieved fame, well, this is for artists, I've seen this with CEOs and politicians. And, and so there's a whole dynamic that shifts. Um, and if, for example, you won a Grammy mm -hmm. and that's all your life was designed towards, Mm -hmm. Once you win that Grammy, then what? Right. Now, what do you have to look for? Uh, yeah, what are you working for? Right at this point, right? You've, so, you've completed so a lot of what times, your, your yeah your goal. Yeah, yeah. So okay, you hit it. Then the next day, you're you know have some type. Oh, is it downer? Right? Like that's <laughs> all that was. Right. Right. I worked my whole life to get that, and that's that's it. Right. Yeah. And so, so I, I've I first started supporting artists around those kinds of things, right? How do you create what my friend Dan Burr says, a bigger big? A bigger big, yeah, sure. Right, a bigger big. And so, so then it's like, well, wait a minute, you know, this is not scalable, it means just doing one-on-one. -on -one. And so that led into courses, right? So mm -hmm. I wanna support more people. So how do you support more people? Well, you know, you create environment, for being able to support more people. <laughs> and so, um, and then it's like, okay, well, wow, supporting these people in Wealth and Impact Bootcamp, for example, right? Some of them have become financially independent. Uh, some of them, you know, have achieved uh, growth of audience and visibility and all of that. Well, what came out of that was the 100 Days Impact Challenge. 100 Days okay. with, a, in case your, your listeners is interested, um, it's out of that came, well, wait a minute, this is something that can help a whole lot of people. Right. I want to hear about the hundred day impact challenge, 
But I'm curious right now because you help what market and promote careers for for big artists, right? Is kind of like is a part of what you do as well. So I'm a bit of a I'll call it a master producer. Okay. Can you explain that? Sure. So I get calls from sometimes a, an artist manager. Um, sometimes it's a new artist, okay. right? And they say, okay, I just discovered this artist, amazing singer. She's amazing. And she hasn't recorded before. And, you know, I, I would love to get you involved in the project okay and do some songs right so when i first started doing doing a lot of that kind of activity so artists would come in and so before i hit note one there's a whole process that of discovery that i go through with the artists uh -huh. right because how are you going to create some music if, if you don't know who you are, right? Uh -huh. If you don't know what it is that you care about. Sure. If you haven't really discovered or thought through, well, where do you, where do you want to fit in the marketplace? What genre do you, right? So because, right. because I have this ability to, to uh, create, and merge genres and create pop music and and hip hop and right i have this producer master producer ability to uh -huh. take an idea and have it be on the radio the next day yeah build it into something successful build it correct. into something yeah. that can go somewhere mm -hmm. right the first thing that i'm thinking is well where is this thing going mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right and so, um, and so it starts there. So I'm, so when I say master producer, it's not just that, yes, I, I write songs, I can produce and play all the instruments on a song. I can do the background vocals. I can coach mm -hmm. the artists on, you know, how to deliver the performance because I've, I've been a performer my, my whole life as well. Uh, it's not just that I can mix the, 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 uh, the record, the songs, right? The singles. It's not just that I can master it as well. Mm -hmm. right? I've done that as well. <laughs> so it's like, it's full stop there. Right. But when we're in the middle of the creation process, as we're creating the song, because I have a business background, because mm -hmm. I understand marketing and branding and uh, cultural narratives, and I'm, I'm a student of social psychology and philosophy and psychology and high performance and behavior and performance, right? All of that is in the studio. Sure. Touring the world, being in front of 40,000 people performing, right? All of that's, all of that's there in the studio when we're working on a song. Mm -hmm. And so, so I can see where the possibilities are for them to go but not just where they can go as a recording artist, but as a human being. Mm -hmm. And not just as a human being, but the products that this human being is able to deliver into the marketplace. So when I'm in that environment with the recording artist that's, that's ready to record, right? We just went through a whole world of discovery and just, and we haven't touched a note yet. <laughs> right, right, right. Because then after that, then the music gets birthed out of the human being, right? Mm -hmm. The music gets born into the world in a way that everyone gets it. Sure. They get this song for this artist and sometimes what comes 
in the recording process is, whoa, this song could do this, 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 this. It could be marketed this way, this way, and that way. Uh-huh. The video, it, sometimes the song, you know, it may be the music that is heard, but the vision around it is enormous. Right, right. <laughs> right? Because I'm thinking, wow, partnerships can be done. With this yeah, song. it's not <laughs> just this song's a hit and it can go on the radio, but it can work. You could not only could it be a hit, but it could also work in this TV show and this movie and this ad campaign and this exactly. commercial. And yeah, I see. Exactly. exactly. You're looking at it as like a full, the full. And piece. that's and that's that's what I call master producer. Gotcha. A master okay. producer is someone that can hold the container of the impact that the artist and the song can have in the world. Mm-hmm. So I have friends of mine that have songs and, and mentors that have songs that are in the fabric of humanity. Okay. Right? That, that have written songs that everyone around the world knows from generation to generation, Mm -hmm. right? Now, that's a song having a life. And so songs can take on lives, just as artists take on lives. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the songs as, as having a life in itself, and as a value creator, as an investor, in assets and people, you know, I look at songs quite differently than a lot of people um, look at songs, right? I look at the ability of a song to have a life. And so part of my thinking when it, when it comes to music is, well, what kind of life is this song gonna have, right? right? Is it gonna live for a long time and be an iconic song that, that stays beyond my lifetime? Mm-hmm. Or is this gonna be a song that is going to be, you know, have the life of a fly. An album cut. <laughs> right. Is this a fly song or is this a whale song? Right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> right. I think whales, you know, some whales stay along uh, for hundreds of years, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like that. Okay. So, yeah, so that's where you kind of help these artists build the whale song, correct? The, the, well, the I, one that I help you- people build their well song Got so, you. so so recording artists and entrepreneurs and and like that so i'm listening for their well song this is the first time i've said that <laughs> here <laughs> here it's been born there's a well song <laughs> i love it <laughs> right there's a well song in your life uh-huh. so so i think that for us as human beings, we have to discover what our whale songs are. I like that. (laughs) The whale songs. And does that play into the 100 Days Impact Challenge? Is that kind of like people searching for their whale songs, so so to speak? Yeah, well, the 100 Days Impact Challenge is a structure and environment for, yes, someone can pursue their whale song in the 100 Days Impact Challenge, right? Well, tell me how this whole thing talent. came about. Like, how did you come up with the concept and what, what is what is the idea behind it? Yeah, so the idea came around election time. Okay. And so Wealth and Impact Bootcamp, I do webinars every month and mm-hmm. um, and I, I, I make it relevant to whatever the community is dealing with or what's happening in the world and, and you know, offer value inside of the context of building wealth and impact. Mm-hmm. And so it was the election month. And I challenged the community to elect themselves, right? Elect their biggest priorities for a fulfilled life. And and I looked at elections and when a president comes into office, they have a hundred days that sets the tone of their entire presidency. So whenever a president comes in office, they hit the ground running, trying to get bills passed, trying to get executive orders. They're trying to undo or, or redo or, or make new, like, like their, right. their agenda, their platform, all of that, they, they hit the ground running in 100 days. And so, so I, 
ask the community, hey, and I challenge the community, who wants to take on 100 days and set the tone of their lives with 100 days? And people raised their hand and said, I'll, I'll do that. And so I created the structure for that to happen and accountability and all, all the things that I know um, in, in studying neuroscience and behavior and, and all of that, all of that got baked into that design. And a month, two months later, I went back and said, okay, how's your 100 days challenge going? And one participant came in, Anne Marie's her name. She said, you know, I've been dealing with, with some health issues and my health has gotten better. My health has gotten better because of the practices I, that I've been doing here. Another person came on and said, hey, I just raised thousands of dollars for this organization in Haiti. I'm gonna go and I'm, I'm flying to Haiti next week. They're like kids and engineers away from me. I never raised money before. What will my mama think about me? <laughs> <laughs> right? A musician came on and said, you know, during COVID, I stopped gigging and I took on going on Facebook and performing every single day. His name is Wolf. And so he would get on Facebook with his guitar and sing every single day for 100 days. And he, he reported back, hey, this is changing my life this is changing my life. And so, so, uh, so I started thinking about it and I said, well, wait a minute, this is something that could help anybody. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and Joe Biden is coming into office in January. What a great way to launch this publicly. Mm -hmm. The same day that Biden starts his 100 days, we can all start 100 days. And so, and that came from uh, Roosevelt, you know, when they were coming out of the, the depression, mm -hmm. that's where the 100 days originated from. Okay, sure. Yeah. And so, so just as we're coming out of the pandemic, right, there's like, we have the opportunity to reset. Mm -hmm to redefine, to reinvigorate, and to pull forth the things that we cared about that we haven't done, that's been sitting on the shelf, that you always wanted to do. And then here's a structure. So, so that's what the 100 Days Impact Challenge is about. It's about taking on that thing that's been there for you for a long time, and you know, there's some people that are musicians. There's some people that are that like want to start businesses. There are people that are just like, I'm going to do gratitude. And there's been uh, movements that have been created out of the 100 Days Impact Challenge, like the Discover Gratitude movement. I like that. that. Yeah, that Noah Press McIntyre he created the, the Discover Gratitude movement out of the 100 Days Impact Challenge. Interesting. And so. So now there's thousands of people that are discovering gratitude, mm -hmm. right? And so the 100 Days Impact Challenge is not just a challenge. It is it is a movement. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's become a bigger than, like, basically how you're talking about songs that living on, you know? It's almost like this is going to become a whale, you, a, a whale song, <laughs> to bring it back to your whale song. <laughs> I like that. That's really cool. And Do you help, like... Um, check in on these people or is it kind of like they have to it's like yeah good question. on their own yeah good question so every monday we have a hundred days inner circle mm -hmm. and that's when people are able to interact with me around their challenge and i bring special guests on oh. so i've had olympian athletes i've had pop stars on i've had uh titans of business I've had people that have done incredible things in the world on from Ted fellows to, uh, you know, people that have mastered finance to, um, in a couple of weeks, we have a relationship duo coming on, oh, cool. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's going to be presenting. And, uh, and it's, it's an incredible opportunity to connect with community 
and also get some specialized knowledge from people that are top of field in various aspects of life. Mm-hmm. I like that. That's really cool. It's yeah, really it's, cool. It's my opportunity as a student too to interact with people that have achieved tremendous things and help so many people and are out there uplifting themselves and others and to be able to interact and share them. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've been You can learn too, I'm sure, right? Yeah, I, I learn something every single day intentionally. I like that. Right? So I, I've designed my life so that every single day I'm, I'm learning intentionally something, mm-hmm. right? That's important, whether that's marketing, whether that's like some area of study, like how the brain works, like how does emotion, how does empathy work, right? These are, these are things um, that I'm curious about. Just like I was curious about the pe- the the pennies and curious about the sounds yeah. on the piano and curious with the saxophone and how to how to make the saxophone sing and sure. curious about creating songs that live beyond my life and creating well songs like I'm curious about all of these things and I'm curious about people. I like that. I'm I'm also curious about people, and that's why I really started the podcast to hear about people's journey and. I was a kid, you know, learning guitar and thought I could be a rock star one day. And I knew that wouldn't get a plan out, pan out, but I'd love to hear how other people were able to achieve that. You know what I mean? Like I, I took found my own journey, but to hear how you became successful in, in this industry, because it's really difficult. So, so Adam, um, I'd like to challenge you. Okay. I'll accept. <laughs> on, what on are we doing? That, that, on something, something that, that you just said. So I have a friend of mine who, um, his, his name is Nick and he's, he works at NASA and he's over in exoplanets, right? So he looks at life on, you know, they're looking for life on other planets. Oh, wow. Right? That's cool. So he became an employee at NASA late in life. Okay. Right. He shifted from one profession And he always wanted to be at NASA. And then he took this pathway, you know, that that he talked about in 100 Days Inner Circle, right? Uh You know, and that it didn't make sense. People were like, ah, ah." other people would think, oh, I'm too old for that and all that. But he took that pathway and is in his dream job at NASA. That's incredible. So, so when you say, you know, being a, a rock star on guitar, the thing that comes to my mind is like a Nick, like the 101 year old that's been through a couple of pandemics that I'm, I'm looking to, to uh, maybe have on 100 Days Impact Challenge. It's like, huh, what am I going to do next? Right? <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that there's an opportunity for you to pursue that, especially now with the likes of YouTube. Oh, sure. Because there's this ageism in the music industry, Uh which I would assert is a, um, you know, keeps great art from being realized for humanity. Yeah. You know, I agree with you for sure. For sure. You can get to a certain age and be like, yeah, well, I can't, that's not going to happen for me anymore. Yeah. I'm too old. <laughs> yeah. Or even artists that have been, been out for a long time. Do you think mm-hmm. Stevie Wonder stopped writing songs? No. Yeah. It's Paul McCartney still putting records out, right? Right. Yeah. It is not too late. If you want to be a rock guitarist, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really want to anymore, but I, I mean, at the time <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> but i get where you're going that makes but that sense that could be that could be your 100 days impact challenge just yeah it. okay okay i like it well i love i love the idea of what you're doing and, and obviously it's really becoming your like you said whale song i love it and it's really amazing and i appreciate you taking time out of your day to chat with me marcus it's been great yeah it's been great great chatting with you too adam Thanks um i do me on Oh, yeah. I do have one more question. I know you've been just dropping so much amazing advice and knowledge throughout this entire thing, but I don't know if you could sum it up if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Yeah, I for aspiring artists, I would recommend 
that they discover their whale song. There you go. That you do the work. That you go about your artistry as I have in, in my life. If, if uh, you know, I, I was on a train one day with a, a well-known music executive in New York and I saw him and we were having this conversation and he gave me this. I was like, wow, the music industry has really changed since you've been involved in it. He's just like, well, I'm a lifer. And he gave me that. I'm a lifer. So if you go at your music career as if you are in it for life, then all of a sudden it gives unlimited possibility for how your career can go. I will leave people with that. I love that. Think bigger. Bring me the best